in the studio this morning. Former National Security Advisor Roy Logones is with us. Welcome to Hot Copy. Thank you for coming to the show. For the invitation. You're actually the, one of the, the best people, sources to ask about President Duterte's recent visit to China, recent uh, visit to Japan. The question now is, what happens after this to the U.S.? Well, uh, I think a lot of analysts are monitoring this very closely. Some are, are a little baffled because they're not seeing uh, conventional development, uh, so to speak. Uh, let's look at China. Let's also look back at Vietnam because Vietnam is also very important. And then, of course, uh, this uh, current yeah. visit, uh, Japan. In the case of uh, China, of course, uh, there's that the, the confusing development when he announced separation, mm -hmm. only to be clarified later that it is a foreign policy drift away from uh, the U.S., not always uh, voting uh, with the U.S. and uh, navigating through an independent uh, foreign policy. Mm -hmm. That's well and good. Mm -hmm. That's provided for in the Constitution. Although, I'd like to say, there is no such thing as independent foreign policy now. People are... Meaning nations, in uh, the world. In, yeah, in the world. Even superpower United States does not have an independent foreign policy. They have to listen to Russia, to China, to EU, mm -hmm. to their allies, to Japan, uh, for example, to India. So all these things will influence their foreign policy, more mm -hmm. so in the case of the Philippines. We have commitments, for example, the Mutual uh, Defense Treaty mm -hmm. uh, forged in uh, mm -hmm. 1951. Uh, do we want to uh, realign that? Do okay. we want to scrap that? But it, what, what, the, the use of the term independent foreign policy, although provided in the Constitution, here President Duterte um, is stressing that it's essentially, it essentially just means the, in, his interest will be the Filipino interest. Yeah, of course. Okay. That, that should be the case always. Okay. Okay. Uh, what is the national interest uh, involved here? And if uh, the national interest uh, would mean aligning uh, with a country like Japan, for example, the U.S., in order to protect us either militarily or economically, that is national interest. Uh, but but uh, we are tied uh, to their fortunes as well. But that is, uh, if, if that is the view, uh, our view of national interest, then let it be so. Mm. Uh, we, we are in the, uh, become okay. interdependent and even dependent. In fact, even the president used uh, dependent uh, when he referred to mm -hmm. China in that uh, speech uh, in the mm -hmm. presence of President Xi. Now, clearly, you have President Duterte that has a very unique style uh -oh. when it comes to dealing with um, countries in China. To please China, he literally lambasted the U.S. Mm -hmm. I mean, during a state visit to another superpower, during his visit to Japan, who is a major ally of the U.S., he clarifies that his interests with China are purely economic. Yes, yes, yes. no military ties. Yes, but you, you understand how some people say it's playing to the crowd he's in. Well, not exactly, because the president also delivered some escaping remarks about the U.S. In Japan. In Japan, in the presence of, uh, I think, the Filipino community. In other words, uh, and then he even announced that uh, in about two years' time, uh, he, he, he would not want uh, soldiers US troops uh, there. But what is uh, very ironic about it, uh, Karen, is that he said it in a country that hosts 50,000 U.S. Uh, troops. Uh, and there's so many bases there, naval yeah. base, air base, uh, army base, and talking about uh, eliminating the foreign troops in the Philippines in a country that hosts uh, foreign troops for their security. Yes. And, yes. you know, so nobody the can question the nationalism of uh, Japan, nobody can question their sense of independence, but they know uh, what they need for security. In other words, uh, they're willing to compromise this quote-unquote uh, sense of independence because of uh, national mm -hmm. security. So they need that yeah. uh, U.S. umbrella yeah. to protect them. But that's the interesting part. You have Japan that's already a superpower, uh -huh. and you put it so well that the Japanese people, the country, moves on its own national mm -hmm. interest. Their culture and traditions are strong. They, they, in other words, they live their life the Japanese way, and yet, there are still bases, U.S. bases there. That's right. Us, on the other hand, the Philippines, we fought out, we kicked out the bases. Mm -hmm. You have people against the EDCA, somewhat the review even of the, what does the mutual defense treaty mean? Mm -hmm. I, I'm trying to say, what is the main difference 
with how Filipinos perceive U.S. presence and how Japanese perceive U.S. presence. Well, let's let's look at 1951 when the MDP was uh, signed. Yeah. Uh, at that time, uh, the threat was uh, communism, uh, but not as big as the threat now. Today, uh, it is 2016, uh, about 60 years uh, after, what is the threat? I go back to the statement of the National Security Council when they appeared before the Senate last year, 2015. Oh. They were asked, what is the biggest threat we're facing? And the NSC said, external threat. And in that particular case, uh, China. Mm. And the threat uh, would be would amount to a very excessive claim against our exclusive economic zone, particularly the West Philippine Sea. 90% of the West Philippine Sea is being claimed by China. They occupy Mississippi Free, they patrol uh, Reed Bank or Recto Bank, they, uh, they mm. uh, blockade the Scarborough Shoal. Mm. Has that changed? It's still there. The threat is still there. So uh, if the threat's still there, why are we talking of uh, even uh, abrogating, uh, yeah. even suggesting the abrogation of the MDT, or uh, even suggesting the termination of EDCA that's, uh, that has not actually been operationalized? Mm. Mm -mm. So why? Yeah, why? Uh, that, that's why, that's why I yeah. said, you know, in foreign policy, I mean, if is you this, change yeah. the direction, there must be a big geopolitical reason. Yes, I agree. It is not something personal. It must be something earth-shaking. It, uh, it must be maybe our allies uh, renege on us, abandon us, uh, then we, we change uh, foreign policy. If there are deficiencies, we just don't abruptly, mm. radically change. We, we talk to them now and you, tell them about our grievances instead of all of a sudden changing mm. direction. So coming from that, you have Ambassador Goldberg, who mm. was in the show last mm. Tuesday, who said, um, it's time for the U.S. and Philippines to sit down and talk. Mm. What do you want? What do we want? Mm. That's number one. Number two, Secretary Asai in another interview said, the U.S. failed us. Do you agree? Well, I, I don't know. He has not really defined it uh, correctly. In, in what sense, uh, for example, economically, there's the BPO. Imagine $25 billion, about 80% of that, are coming from the United States. When it comes to security umbrella, well, you know, some people say we, the U.S. Uh, did not give enough uh, military aid. Compared to, the middle, co compared to the Middle East countries. Well, you know, yeah. that, that, that is something yeah. that I would like to explain. The reason why they're giving a lot of uh, aid to Israel is because they're in a war zone. Mm -hmm. Israel is facing an existential threat. They're giving aid to Egypt in order to rein them in, in order to make them friendlier instead of uh, being aggressive mm -hmm. against uh, Israel. They're giving a lot of assistance to Pakistan mm. in order for Pakistan to help them in mm. the war against the Taliban. Mm. Those are war zones. We should be happy that we are not in a war zone. Mm. If we are in a war zone, I'm very sure the U.S. will give us mm. uh, a lot of assistance. But we should not pray for that. You were saying something that uh, you were not able to continue. You said it's not part of... Uh, oh, isn't it part of the mutual defense treaty? It's not part, you know, giving uh, military. It's not part. Uh, really? There's something else. Uh, FMS, for example, foreign military sales, this will involve selling equipment, mm -hmm. uh, the, the so-called uh, excess defense articles, yeah. equipment that they don't need anymore, still good but use, and usable by other uh, uh, countries that are not superpowers, uh -oh. uh, like, for example, frigates, helicopters. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we can buy them at yes. a very good price. Yeah. But uh, they're not uh, obligated to give us hundreds of millions of dollars uh, worth mm -hmm. of uh, equipment. Mm -hmm. So, but, you know, if you go back uh, to how it was when the military bases were here, you know, in the 50s and the 60s, we had the very good equipment, like, for example, in the 50s, we already had the, the uh, F-86 Saber jets that were almost top of the line during that time. So is it time then, uh, coming from your analysis, is mm. it time to already review the Mutual Defense Treaty? Well, definitely. We have to review it. Uh, we have to look at the threats, uh, for example. And we have to also consider the network mm. of uh, security okay. alliances. We belong to a network. Yes, yes. And uh, if we do something that is going to uh, adversely affect 
that network, like for example, Japan mm. is uh, betting that we'll, we're, we will continue to be part of that family of alliances. In, fa in fact, Japan has verbalized they're very worried. Oh, yeah, they, they, yeah. they should be. I, I remember when I was National Security Advisor, I would always uh, link up with some members of the U.S. Embassy, even the, uh, I mean, the Japan Embassy, even the Japanese ambassador himself uh, exchanging views on the situation in the South China Sea. Because to them, even if it is the South China Sea, that is very vital to mm -hmm. their security. They are in the East China Sea area, but the South China Sea is very important for them economically and militarily and security-wise. Okay. All right.